避免綜藝館嘅節目及觀眾受到騷擾，請各位關掉你嘅流動電話，並將手錶及傳呼機嘅響鈕裝置關上。請勿在場外飲食或擅自攝影、錄影及錄音，敬請合作。Dear patrons, to avoid undue disturbance to the program and the audience. Please switch off your mobile phones as well as the beeping devices on your watches and pages before the program. Eating and drinking, as well as unauthorized photography, video and audio recordings in the auditorium are forbidden. Thank you for your cooperation. Sorry for no lion dance this morning, but instead we are trying to very use a no. Actually, the venue here tried to use a very boring notice to try to wake you up, but from the noise, I think obviously you are all wake up. So, uh, but well, once again, my one of the stage manager here, or oh, no, yeah, yeah, he he's going to give me some notes again, properly. Yeah, it looks like the yesterday's one. Yeah, remind you to take. The tickets because they have found some tickets to get here is lost. They they found it. So you remember because if you know tickets, uh, you probably you need to wait. But yeah, uh, you know bureaucracy. So uh, and also this is really weird for me because I have spotted some quite interesting crowd yesterday because uh, there is 15 students or more from Kazakhstan. Can you stand up to represent yourself? Oh, there's a lot of you. Yes, so there is a lot of you overwhelming us, almost. Right, so, well, actually we don't prepare anything about Kazakhstan. And probably the only thing I know is probably Borat. Sorry? <laughs> oh no. Not, I don't want to offend them. Anyway, but I think, I think, I think it's a quite the, the nation is quite beautiful. I I would like to visit one day. Right. So, but we actually prepare something more close to us. Yes, just uh, twenty or thirty kilometers away from us. So I would like to, because Mr. Mr. Okamoto has said that he wants to have some local keynote speaker, so we invited one of the experts in this field, or very very early adopter of the internet in Hong Kong, um, Mr. Charles Mock, he's, uh, oh, technically he's honorable, right honorable legislator, <laughs> Charles Mock, to come to present for us. The keynote speaking is one internet, two system, not one country, two systems. Internet in China and Hong Kong, they are far different. Welcome. Okay, good morning. Uh, I wasn't expect so many of you to be here on a Saturday morning because I thought most of you probably would be shopping or doing other things in Hong Kong. But uh, apparently you find this to be more fun than going out in uh, you know, a sunny, bright day in Hong Kong. Too hot, to maybe. Uh, but when I, when I look down from the stage, uh, actually, well, first of all, you, there, 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 were, there are more of you here than I thought. But second, uh, I see that unlike yesterday, the first two rows are not filled. And uh, the first feeling that I got when I, when I, when I watched from the stage, back down uh, stage, the first thought I, can, I thought of was actually, hey, it looks like the great firewall <laughs> of China, of the internet, of course, that's what I'm talking about. The reason is, there's a Chinese name for the, uh, this great firewall, great internet firewall of uh, censorship, which actually they call the Golden Shield. 
And if you look at this first two row, it does look like the golden shield. But there are a few of you brave ones that are willing to, you know, sit on the golden shield. So that's good. Uh, but anyway, so thank you for being here. Uh, I have to go back and forth and, uh, and uh, press my slide. Uh, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, I, uh, I came back from the United States after, work, uh, after school and, and, uh, and working in the U.S. for some years, more than 10 years, and then I came back to Hong Kong in 1994. And uh, I was fortunately to be one of the earlier people that started an internet service provider in Hong Kong back then in 1994 or 5. And uh, I, so... The slide here said that I was the uh, former chairman and co-founder of the Internet Service Provider Association. And uh, by being that, actually that means I came originally from the, uh, from the uh, provider side, from the, from the business side uh, of the service provider. But, of course, but, but later on, actually, uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, actually, I don't know, maybe eight years or so ago, uh, I uh, co-founded the, the ISOC, Internet Society Hong Kong chapter. For some reason, there wasn't a chapter here until, in Hong Kong until quite a few years ago. So uh, a few of us started the ISOC chapter. So then I sort of switched to the user constituent. Uh, but uh, I, I still, my background has been in IT and uh, technology, and, uh, but now my role is actually uh, uh, le a legislative councillor in Hong Kong, which is actually our lawmaking body, our legislature. So I am one of the representatives in our legislature. But we have a very strange system. I felt that maybe I should tell you a little bit about it just to <laughs> let you know <laughs> what I do. Uh, but uh, uh, I actually represent IT in our legislature. Uh, rather than a geographic constituent, like uh, a district or whatever, uh, which is a very strange system, which is actually a system that many of us want to get rid of, uh, myself included. But uh, for a lot of political reasons, uh, we have this sort of a, a functional constituencies representing businesses and representing professional sectors in Hong Kong, which is probably a convenient way for uh, you know, the powers that be to control uh, our government and our policies. But anyway, that's topic for another, for another day. But just to let you know that actually, in a sense, I moved from uh, technology to uh, politics now. But uh, today's uh, topic, uh, we probably will have a chance to touch on both of those issues. But first of all, I just want to look at, uh, with you, the state of the internet in... Uh, 2013. Uh, these are some of the numbers. Of course, every month when you check the numbers, the numbers may be different. And uh, uh, how, many of the, how many users are there today on the internet? 2.7 billion. And uh, I, for, because, okay, because I want to talk to, with, with you about the situation of the internet in China and in Hong Kong. So uh, first of all, let's look at the number of internet users in China. Uh, there's actually 591 million users. Uh, uh, of the internet in China, according to whatever latest numbers we get. And if you look at that compared to the global number, that is actually uh, more than 20%, but not quite 25%, uh, not quite one quarter, but uh, close to that number. So quite a lot of, so, so, uh, so, so actually, you know, internet in terms of users, uh, China is actually uh, a big player. Uh, if you look at the comparison with the global uh, population, with the population of China, you can see that uh, the globally, internet population is uh, about 40% of the world's population, while in China, despite the fact that uh, we have, we're talking about over 20% of the internet users being from China, but actually uh, that represents only uh, just a bit over 20% of the population in China. So in other words, there's, oh, well, well, sorry, 21% uh, of the, uh, oh, that represents 21% of the uh, uh, global number. But uh, when I look at some of, when we look at some of the numbers later on, you will see that actually there's still a lot of room for growth in the internet uh, population in China. Now, why did I call my presentation One Internet, Two Systems? It's because, uh, uh, first of all, you are all in China right now, but uh, uh, there isn't a, Fire war uh, in Hong Kong uh, because uh, we have a system called one country, two system. 
which applies to Hong Kong. And in fact, it doesn't apply to just Hong Kong. It applies to, uh, it applies to actually also a little place just around here, which is Macau. Uh, there's also a Macau Special Administrative Region. So in reality, already, uh, let's not, not talk about even Taiwan for the moment. There are actually one country, three systems already uh, uh, with Macau, OK? Uh, so, so the whole idea is that we are continuing, because of course, Macau used to be a Portuguese colony, and Hong Kong used to be a, a British colony. So uh, the whole idea is to take back the sovereignty, but without changing most of the ways that the, the, the things work. But uh, sovereignty-wise, uh, you know, China, uh, Hong Kong and Macau do belong to China as a part of China. Uh, but we have a special administrative region. Supposedly, we run ourselves. But of course, uh, for foreign policies and national matters, we reverted to the national government, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and one of the fortunate things for us is that uh, partially and mostly because of that, uh, we don't have uh, our great firewall of Hong Kong. So you can surf freely in Hong Kong, unlike if you are in China. How many of you been, uh, have you tried to access the internet uh, when, uh, when uh, you were in China? How many, of, how many of you? How many of you could get to all the websites that you wanted to go to, including Wiki? Oh, one of you, or a few of you. So what do you do? Well, OK, I'm talking, sorry. Oh, good. <laughs> you caught me. You caught me. I should have, been, I should have said mainland China. <laughs> mainland China. Oh, I don't have a price for you. Otherwise, I'll throw you a t-shirt. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, mainland China. OK, how many of you have been to mainland China and you, could, and, and, and you found it difficult to surf Wikipedia? or other sites that you wanted to go to? Uh, how many of you felt that there's no problem? You, you, no problem for you. What do you do? Yeah, they make special arrangements when there are sometimes uh, these big events, like WTO meetings, uh, or World Wide Web uh, Symposium, or the or ICANN meetings in, in Shanghai or Beijing, and so on. They do that. But uh, once you get back to your hotel, sorry, right? So. Anyway, yeah, even two systems within China sometimes. So uh, when we generally think of, when many people generally think of China, they think of this brick, people are looking at this brick wall uh, on their monitor. Everything is being filtered. Well, there's yes and no to it, uh, because to many of us, if you've been to China before the internet uh, became popular in China, actually, the amount of information is even less. So even now, with censorship, like it or not, not being a defender of the system, uh, people actually do see a lot more than they did before. And the other very important thing, of course, is with Web 2.0, uh, this user-created content, including Wiki, uh, content doesn't just come top down. So it's actually becoming more and more difficult for uh, censors to filter, because it's not like they could just filter a few main sources of information. They have to filter everybody, everyone that's contributing, writing their, their tweets and, and uh, posting themselves on, uh, posting their notes onto, uh, onto social media platforms and so on. They have to, they have to censor everyone, uh, which will come to that. Actually, how are they going, how, how, what, what did they do to accomplish that? But before that, let's take a quick snapshot at uh, the, uh, internet situation in China. These are some of the numbers. Again, again, we saw that number, 591 million internet users. It's actually a 44% internet penetration for China. But more and more importantly, uh, it's really about mobile phones. Um, uh, uh, and actually, the mobile phone penetration, uh, especially smartphone penetration in China, is picking up very rapidly. Uh, they have their, their own uh, uh, sort of copycat uh, uh, smartphones and so on, running Android and other, or even sometimes uh, or, or other platforms, and uh, and uh, they're much cheaper, so uh, more affordable to the local people. And uh, the in, the mobile internet penetration is actually very high, uh, but of course not all of them are on smartphone. Uh, and uh, you see a pretty young age uh, group, of main age group for the internet users under 40. 
And uh, the, this is the average time of connection that uh, they have on the internet, on P mainly on PCs, because mobile is very, very difficult to, to measure anymore. So remember some of these numbers. We'll come back to them when we look at Hong Kong's situation. Now, OK, uh, but how do they manage the internet? Before, I think many people think of the way that uh, a censor uh, or China or some of these authoritative governments the way to censor is to try to stop everything from going through. But in fact, uh, the way that uh, some of the academics frame this whole uh, uh, way of, of, of this control is actually very much like waterworks or uh, irrigation. You know, how do you control rivers, irrigation? Do you just build dams and stop them from coming through? Well, you have to have some outlets, right, to uh, let the, what, some of the water flow through. Otherwise, you know, your dams will break. So that's exactly what they do. They block some, they release some, they block some, they release some, uh, depending on time, depending on the content. They have to let people have a way of having an outlet. But at the same time, what is most important, most sensitive, they keep a very strict uh, stronghold on controlling those content. Now, recently, for example, this is not just about the internet, but you see uh, seven subjects that uh, recently, you know, we have a new administration in China, a new chairman, a new president of China, a new premier of China uh, with, the, uh, with the Chinese government uh, in uh, this year. And uh, very soon after they came on board, they actually released uh, a seven-point bulletin that people should not talk about in universities. Uh, and these are the things that they shouldn't talk about. If you are a university professor in China and you are doing a seminar in a university in China, supposedly, if you follow the rules, you, know, you have to stay away from talking about these seven things, universal values. You could talk about Chinese values. Uh, uh, press, uh, uh, don't, don't, don't ask me what the difference is, <laughs> OK? Uh, press freedom, civil society, civil right. This one is obvious, right? You, couldn't talk, you shouldn't talk about this. Past mistake of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, Crony capitalist. Uh, you shouldn't even criticize the capitalist because it is a communist country, OK? I don't, you, you, you figure out the logic, okay? <laughs> who's, who's on which side, okay? Uh, and judicial independence is also something that's a no-no. So these are the seven things that you shouldn't talk about on, uh, in universities. But then again, actually, if you go onto the internet, actually quite a lot of people do try to talk about these issues all the time, particularly, like I said, because there's a lot of bottom-up information. Uh, a lot of these bottom-up information from social media and so on. Now, uh, Wiki. What about Wiki? Your good old Wiki. Uh, some of the, you, you probably, uh, this is actually, I made sure that these information are actually the sources from Wikipedia. So if it's incorrect, then uh, <laughs> blame, don't, don't blame anyone, no. <laughs> uh, uh, supposedly, probably, I, I'm sure actually these numbers are just some, you know, some numbers, but actually it could have been more. Uh, it was blocked for seven times at least since 2004, uh, filtered and blocked uh, traffic to uh, sensitive articles like uh, Jimmy uh, mentioned yesterday. Uh, instead of blocking the whole site, uh, they are resorting to blocking certain uh, uh, materials, certain pages, certain articles. Uh, and uh, even 2013, HTTPS traffic is, uh, in even encrypted connections are, are beginning to be blocked. Uh, and China's strategy on censorship uh, control uh, is actually sometimes what we call a technocratic micromanagement. They use a lot of technology. But it's also very micromanaged in the sense that uh, it's not just, OK, I set up a filter and let it run and uh, filter out certain keywords and so on, uh, or artificial intelligence, whatever. There's actually massive number of people involved to look at and filter those information. 
Uh, actually, I think a very interesting comparison now is how the Chinese would, has been doing it and how the NSA has been doing it. But I guess it's uh, very difficult for us to find the information to compare. Uh, but uh, uh, so, uh, but, but, but I think over the last 10, 15 or so years, China has learned a lot to perfect the system, uh, if we can use that word. Uh, they want to appear to be reasonable. Like I said, they let something go, so you feel that, hey, it's not totally like I cannot talk about anything. I could talk about something. But then, okay, I begin to know where the line is drawn, and then uh, I should stay clear of that line, okay? So that is the so sort of uh, mentality that people or even internet users are being trained in China to follow. So you have to, uh, so the sensor, even the sensors have to appear to be reasonable. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, they even start to censor before a certain sensitive matter may happen. So the keywords that may have to do with uh, certain figures, persons, when a particular scandal broke and then wait even before or just before that news is broken, um, through the official channels, the major uh, social media, for example, or the major search engines will receive the notice that uh, they would put certain words into the keyword uh, or the blacklist. Uh, and uh, they sometimes, they, they actually do even uh, control, they could control down to the message level. Uh, the uh, treated-like messages that uh, on the similar platforms in China and even your SMSs. Uh, and uh, they, of course, also from the media point of view, uh, the news carrying sites, uh, they also have a very sophisticated system to control these news sites so that they would downplay or not report on sensitive news. Of course, then people have to circumvent the firewall in order to read those news by coming out of the firewall and come to, let's say, a site in Hong Kong. Uh, but more and more, we're also seeing a uh, new approach of a more subtle and middle, sort of a middle course, which is to balance the, uh, to balance the control between the, 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 the will to control and the economic need for more free flow of information. And that is actually, of course, still a matter that the censors and the administration in China has to deal with, because on the one hand, they know full well that uh, by having this system, actually it is not good completely, not good for their, their uh, economic development. Uh, but on the other hand, because of political reasons, they do feel that they continue to have to have this control. So it's, the system is continually being modulated and fine-tuned. And one of the ways that they do this is by working with the major large internet providers in, in China. Uh, back many years ago, uh, maybe let's say the uh, early 2000, uh, or even a bit before that, uh, many of these companies, including, for example, Yahoo. Yahoo is probably the only foreign or international names you see here because they were the earliest that has gone into China, but they haven't been very successful. Uh, and be, the, the reason being that they are a, 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 an international company, not a Chinese company. And uh, Yahoo and other companies, other international companies, uh, many of them uh, around 2000 or, or before and after that period, they went into China and they have encountered a lot of problems dealing with the officials' uh, control in China. And uh, what happened to Google uh, is well documented. You know, a couple of years ago, they sort of exited China. They didn't really totally exit sit from China. They, are still, they still get quite a lot of advertising money from China. They do, still probably do some R&D there. But in terms of search engines, they don't run the search engines from China anymore because they have to be subjected to a, uh, a blacklist uh, 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 that, uh, that probably the company didn't want to adhere to, uh, so they decided not to do that. Uh, but so the Chinese strategy is actually to encourage local companies, Chinese companies, to take over. If I don't let Twitter to come in, then I would encourage uh, Sina and Sohu and Tencent these companies to set up their own microblogs. 
And, that, and uh, they are actually massively more popular than Twitter in China because Twitter is blocked. Uh, likewise with Facebook, they have their own copycat version. Uh, this is actually very much an encouraged policy. And not only that, it's not just any Chinese company. They want to make sure that this is the big one. Because if you are the government and you want to control information, you want to just work with a few of these big companies rather than 10,000 small companies. So in fact, uh, uh, policy-wise, we see a lot of uh, inclination to support the, the, uh, the uh, larger players because the larger players tend to be more uh, working in unison <laughs> with the government and, uh, according to, and, and follow government policies. When there comes to a point when you have to t switch off uh, you know, keywords about Tibet or whatever, they would follow. But if you have a lot of these companies around, small ones and so on, they feel that they cannot control them more. So this is very much the situation in China. And uh, you know, aggregating to the top big players. And uh, these are a couple of the new, uh, new newly uh, uh, announced initiatives in China, including the real name system. Supposedly, it will be fully implemented by 2014. Uh, which probably means that when you log on to certain, uh, uh, when you join certain sites, including, of course, we're talking about the mainland, uh, social media site, for example, Sina Weibo, the uh, Twitter-like system in China, the most popular one, uh, and so on. Many of these social media uh, platforms and so on, um, you have to submit your real name um, with a personal uh, information with your ID card number or whatever. That's supposedly uh, what needs to be done. But uh, whether or not it will really happen, will, it remains to be seen because we remember many years ago, actually China did try to do the same thing with SMS. Uh, but uh, later on, it really didn't go anywhere. So uh, we'll, we'll see whether it really come to realization this time. Uh, and they're also drafting a new uh, privacy law uh, and internet privacy uh, regulations. Of course, uh, uh, it remains to be seen whether it, the law will be to, for more for protecting the users or more for protecting the government to uh, make sure that they can get the information they want. Uh, and of course, uh, content monitoring, self-censorship, and uh, mandatory reporting of state secrets and impermissible content for network and information security reasons. Uh, these are always the, like the, uh, like the uh, ultimate ultimatum that the government can use in order to get information or stop certain companies from uh, doing certain things. It's always about national security, right? It's actually anywhere in the world, but uh, China, of course, is uh, doing quite a lot of that. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, Weibo. Weibo means microblog in China. And it's uh, actually the company up to now with the most user is uh, the Sina Weibo. Uh, it's again uh, uh, so started as a copycat uh, Twitter-like uh, service, uh, but indeed uh, they put in a lot of uh, uh, innovation and uh, good features actually. Uh, to me as a user, actually Weibo is a much better, more, more advanced to me. Uh, or from the user and experience point of view, much if actually much better than Twitter. But, uh, but it started out really as this copycat uh, service. But uh, we really couldn't say everything we want on Weibo, okay? And uh, there's a certain group of uh, researchers in the University of Hong Kong that started a project called Weibo Scope. And what they did was they capture the, uh, these micro contents in China, in Sina Weibo, and uh, compare them from time to time to discover what are the uh, content that are being removed. And you could go on to this site in order to look at those content that has been removed. And uh, they also did quite a bit of analysis as to what types of content, what types of users content are being removed and how frequent or how quickly these content are being removed. So it's very, very interesting and sort of getting a glimpse as to how the sensors uh, work. And, uh, and uh, in general, uh, what we can say is that uh, we, they found that uh, 
Okay, the more, which is pretty intu intuitive. The more influential you are, the more followers you have, you will be watched. And then your stuff will be removed if it's sensitive. Your stuff will be removed faster than just the average guy with 10 followers, okay? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, we do expect that with the real name system, if it is successfully fully implemented in 2014, there will be a chilling effect. Uh, people will be more intimidated in talking about uh, uh, certain matters. Uh, but then again, today at least, how do people evade this censorship uh, on Weibo? Uh, they have a term in China that directly translated, it means uh, hitting edge ball, or what it means is you hit the ball right on the edge without going, oops, uh, out of bound, okay? So just keeping it inbound, but going all the way to the, to the edge, uh, which is to, well, testing the limit. You know what is within the limit that you can talk about, but not going any beyond that. Uh, they also use a lot of images because censoring the images, of course, tend to be more difficult than censoring certain keywords, whether it be in, of course, uh, you could also try to do it in English or other languages, non-Chinese languages, then the censor may overlook it. But then again, the readers don't understand either, so that's probably not very effective, but you could do that too. But then you limit, but censors are always like that. You know, CNN has been in China for many, many decades, right? But only, you could only watch it from the hotel, so, uh, so that's fine, right? So censors are never 100% but they select the audience, right? So if it is in another language, typically it's, you, can get, you can get beyond the edge, but then nobody watches. Uh, but they are also using images and uh, creating new terms to, to, uh, to represent a certain idea without directly saying that word, okay? Uh, uh, there were actually, for example, a couple of years ago when uh, Mr. Liu Xiaobo uh, received the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize uh, uh, for, for his work. He's still in prison in China, by the way, for probably a long time to come. Uh, but this, but uh, uh, he received the Peace Prize a couple of years ago. And we, you, there were no, no report about this sort of thing in China at all. But a lot of users actually posted on their social media, on the Weibo about this incident and, and discussing it and so on. So what did they do? They couldn't say his name. His name, in, of course, definitely in Chinese and maybe even in English, is, was uh, banned. It would be automatically filtered. You couldn't even post that, uh, that, that post. So what did they do? They used an empty chair, uh, which actually was also when, uh, when his Peace Prize was uh, presented to him in, the, in the, what was it, in, in the Stockholm. Oslo, Oslo, right, right. Peace Prize, different, right? In Oslo, when they, uh, so they, they presented the prize, they presented the prize to a, an empty chair. So an empty chair represented that particular certain idea. So that's the way they let these uh, uh, ideas flow. Okay. Uh, so, but, 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 okay. So uh, what do you do in China if you work in China? If you're a student or actually if you work for a company, even a multinational in, in China, what do you do? Actually for a lot of multinational companies, uh, getting, all, getting free and full access to the internet is critical for their business, right? Uh, if you are in China and you could only get sporadic, uh, 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 sporadic uh, uh, access to Gmail or whatever, some of the new sites and news, uh, websites and so on, it's going to be very inconvenient, right? So actually, uh, most people use VPN. And it is not, and it is not, and that is permissible, okay? Uh, in fact, there are a lot of these VPN services in China, if you happen to work in China for, uh, for a company or whatever, or a university, uh, it, it, your company systems, uh, when you connect them to the domestic uh, Chinese ISPs and so on, of course, it's being filtered, but you could go on your VPN and circumvent it. And that is tot pretty much totally acceptable. Why? Again, because you have to pay a price. 
that means only a minority of people can do it, not everyone. Not everyone would be willing to pay and not everyone will be willing to take even the trouble to learn. It's pretty cumbersome sometimes. Uh, and uh, so people, most people, 90% of the people or more actually would choose not to do it. So that, that's also how the sensor thinks. They just make it inconvenient. But then again, if you really want to, actually those people who, willing, who are willing to go the distance, they could always uh, use VPN. Uh, nobody really have a exact figure on how many people in China is really using this to circumvent on a, period, on a very regular basis. But it must be in the millions. But of course, when we're talking about hundreds of millions of users, that might still be a very small minority. Uh, and last thing about China that I would say is that actually, despite all these, uh, all these uh, uh, censorship and so on, the internet is becoming more and more important in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in China in the sense that actually we do see a lot of uh, uh, struggle, power struggle, scandals, and so on. They're being broken on the internet. Uh, this is a recent case that uh, actually a Chinese reporter from the official Chinese news agencies cho chose to use their Weibo, which is, uh, uh, you know, again, the treated like surface, to expose a state enterprise, uh, supposed corruption uh, uh, in China. So actually, uh, you do see even officials, uh, uh, background uh, organizations and people using the internet to, uh, to their own purpose, to their own advantage. Uh, so this is, uh, so, don't, so sometimes we cannot think of the China's internet situation like a very simple, uh, filtered in and out situation. Okay, so quickly, let's take a look at Hong Kong, which is uh, probably, uh, I don't know, not as, not as exciting because it's just very, uh, more like the rest of the world. Uh, but actually, uh, we do have very, very high uh, household. Well, let me, let me compare some of these numbers. Uh, I didn't put them on the same slide, but uh, with the numbers that we talked about in China. For example, the... Uh, in our household broadband penetration is 85.2%, uh, and we looked at the internet penetration in China, which was just 44%, so we're almost double uh, the, uh, in, uh, uh, that in China. But of course, Hong Kong is very small and, and concentrated, so it's much easier to deal with. Uh, our mobile penetration, the mobile penetration we talked about in China was 78%, but mobile penetration in Hong Kong is 229%. Uh, most of us have, uh, 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 have two or more phones in, or, or iPads in our pockets. That's how this number comes, to, comes about. Uh, I have one here, one is down there. Uh, uh, someone helping me taking picture with my iPhone. So, uh, <laughs> so, so uh, everyone has more than one. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, uh, mobile internet penetration is 65%. Uh, and uh, the average time spent is slightly more than in China, but again, this is mostly PC numbers, so it's probably not very relevant anymore. Uh, and uh, uh, 30 hours per week, they are not, uh, okay, 77% household with PC and broadband. So pretty, pretty good numbers uh, in terms of penetration and usage. Uh, and if we look at the major uh, providers in Hong Kong, uh, we see uh, much more uh, diverse, uh, uh, different kinds of companies, international companies, big social networking sites, uh, Facebook, Google, and so on, including even some of the Chinese sites like Athena uh, and so on. Uh, we also see uh, increasingly quite uh, vibrant online uh, journalism uh, from local uh, uh, activists and also uh, quite a lot of discussion board, BBS types of discussion boards uh, in Hong Kong. They are quite, also quite uh, popular, like the ones on top, you want, golden, and so on. So, you know, these are some of the, uh, the, mo the more diverse uh, landscape that we see in Hong Kong. Uh, we have no internet censorship in Hong Kong, but are we really facing a free internet? Uh, that is a question that Many of us internet users in Hong Kong 
do have to guard ourselves uh, and be, be careful about some of the things that might happen to us, okay? Uh, I'll go through a couple of the examples of, uh, of, of, of what government in Hong Kong, the government in Hong Kong might be trying to, you know, uh, put in certain more control in this area and that area. But if you look at everywhere in the world, actually, I have to say, even for a lot of the, most of the Western democracies, uh, you, do, you, you are seeing that trend. We, in Hong Kong, we don't that much talk about national security as a reason, but they might talk about crime, crime prevention and all these other reasons, and uh, cyberbullying and so on. So uh, any of these could become excuse for the censors to come in. So that is uh, what we really have to uh, guard against, despite the fact that in our basic law, which is many times we look at as a mini constitution for Hong Kong with our central government, uh, it does specify that we should have freedom and privacy of communications of Hong Kong residents being protected by law. But of course, you know, everybody says that in their constitution. But uh, uh, anyway, so uh, what do we do when it comes to our legal safeguards and, uh, and uh, uh, internet cyber related uh, legislative infrastructure in Hong Kong? Uh, the main one is actually the crimes ordinance, which is general purpose. But within the crime ordinance, uh, uh, there is a certain clause, uh, the section 161, which talk, uh, uh, which talk about uh, access to, communicate to computers with criminal or dishonest intent, which is actually very broad. I don't want, I don't want to and I don't need to read all these uh, legal languages in the, in the law, but uh, it's an umbrella. Uh, sorry, the word umbrella is shielded. But uh, it is an umbrella that any of these things, if you're talking about hacking, cyber attacks, DDoS, for example, uh, sometimes even some people, did for fun or for whatever reason, I hope they didn't, I'm sure they didn't do it on, on Wiki, but uh, some people might distribute false news uh, and pretending it to be a government uh, press release and so on, that happens before. Uh, and any of these, uh, and actually there was one recent case that uh, somebody was uh, using a, 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 either cell phone or, or a little camera and uh, trying to take a picture of a lady in the, the underskirt pictures. And, uh, and the government or, or the police actually used this, uh, this, this uh, clause in the law to prosecute the guy. So access to computer with crime, criminal or dishonest intent uh, is a catch-all, for better or for worse. I say for better or for worse is because in some ways you do need some of these catch-all laws in, in the books in order to you know, uh, catch some of the special situations maybe. But on the other hand, it might become very dangerous. And uh, the law enforcement persons might feel that uh, you know, I could, you know, how many, of, I don't know, I mean, uh, if, what if I tell a lie to, to uh, my friends uh, uh, on, 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 the, on the internet, uh, on, on, in my email? I'm dishonest on the internet. I, what, what might happen to, to me? I mean, it's can, it can be very broad if you have to interpret it that way. So uh, on the other hand, it might also be used by or misused by the police to be uh, when they get too complacent. Because we are seeing actually, for example, some of these actually could be quite serious uh, matters that could be dealt with, with other parts of the law. Uh, that they probably are using a very simple uh, uh, clause in the law with a smaller, lesser need to raise enough evidence in order to get a successful prosecution, in order to get it done and just get it over with. Uh, so it works both ways. It could be too strict or it could be become too lenient. Uh, so that, that is one issue that we actually, myself, uh, uh, and very few other legislators, because most are not very interested, but uh, uh, that, that at least I'm, I'm, I'm interested in looking at. Uh, quickly, a couple of other uh, things that uh, are of interest to us when we look at our legal uh, framework uh, over the internet in Hong Kong. Uh, another one is the uh, control of obscene and indecent article ordinance. Basically, it has to do with pornography and that sort of stuff. Uh, and uh, so, 
couple of years ago, actually more, uh, four or five years ago, 2008, the government came out with a uh, uh, consultation. And one of the suggestions was mandatory filtering for all IFPs in Hong Kong uh, with a centralized blacklist of sites. Well, in that sense, they are very advanced, you know, much earlier than SOPER and so on, right? Uh, but uh, fortunately, that, that didn't go through. Uh, at the time, they actually, the government actually told us, the Australians are already doing it. And I had to go to the Internet Society Australia. Anyone from Australia here? Anyone from ISOC Australia here? Well, I went to ISOC Australia and said, what's happening? What's happening? We're, read, we're trying to read in the news, but we don't know exactly what's happening over there. They said, oh, the government, uh, Kevin Rudd's last government was trying to do this, uh, but uh, they, it was just a trial, and the trial was disaster, disastrous uh, results, and, and so on. So, uh, so uh, lots of opposition. And you know what? Our government is telling us Australia has already done it. Uh, and uh, fortunately, with the help of our Australian friends, we were able to disprove what our government told us, and uh, in the end, they didn't do it. Uh, but you know, governments, they, for many of these reasons, for uh, anti-pornography, for anti-cyberbullying, and so on, they will keep on thinking of ways uh, to, to get their hands into the cookie jar. And uh, not only that, there are admittedly also a lot of people in the community that would want the government to do more also. So that's something that we have to be very careful about. Uh, next. Uh, uh, this is actually, in, for the last two years, has been a very uh, hotly debated issue in Hong Kong, which is uh, the copyright ordinance. Uh, because uh, in recent years, if you look at many of the Western governments in Europe and Australia, New Zealand and so on, many of them are beginning to uh, implement exemption for parody, uh, derivative works, uh, particularly for satirical or, or, or parody. Par uh, pa uh, parody use, uh, giving them statutory exemption, either criminal or civil exemption or both, uh, in different cases, in different countries, uh, giving them this sort of exemption. So last year when the government was trying to amend our copyright ordinance, uh, they omitted to talk about that part. And there were a lot of uh, outcry from the community and from our uh, uh, netizens, uh, uh, civil society, saying that you cannot do that. We don't trust our government because most of the, per, the uh, in Hong Kong, actually, I, I don't know whether I could say most, but a lot, a lot of these works of derivative works on existing copyrighted works, particularly, for example, I show a couple of movie posters because I think those are easiest for international audience to, to know what we are talking about. Uh, this, these are some of the, the, the movie posters that were uh, derivative works of existing uh, well-known movie posters uh, on using the images of uh, local political figures. Uh, at particularly, the, this person happened to be one of the candidates of our chief executive election last year. And uh, instead of the Iron Lady, she become the this word means sell, uh, so selling out, the selling out lady. Of course, he's a man, but uh, anyway, so they are using these ways to make fun, and uh, they were very worried that if the government chose to prosecute them for political reasons, uh, then what happens? So they want to have exemptions and so on. So the government is still now just uh, revising, reviving a uh, consultation to further discuss this issue. So this is also one area that is uh, very hotly debated in Hong Kong. Uh, and finally, uh, in our telecommunications ordinance and in our privacy ordinance, there are also other uh, statutory uh, uh, protection or, or, or you know, related control on the internet uh, relating to, for example, interception of communication uh, being, being barred, being prevented in our telecom ordinance uh, uh, preventing interception of communications uh, and uh, a certain, you know, privacy protection. I wouldn't go into the detail of that. So these are all the, pretty much our regulatory framework, uh, which is all fine and good, but in the end, 
uh, what if governments don't do what they say? It could happen in other governments. Uh, it could also, of course, happen in Hong Kong as well. And in the end, um, as Ms. Our, one of our earlier visitors to Hong Kong, <laughs> I uh, did not have the privilege to meet him, uh, but I later on found out I had only a one degree of separation with uh, Mr. Slowden because the, the uh, lawyer that he used was actually a lawyer that I used as well. But <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that at the time. Otherwise, I would have said I want to go to his birthday party. <laughs> they actually had a birthday party, supposedly get, buying him some uh, 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 pizza and, and birthday cakes, whatever. But I didn't go. Anyway, so uh, when... So as Mr. Slowden revealed, when he, particularly when he was in Hong Kong, uh, with the, uh, uh, what happened it, with all these uh, PRISM uh, projects and uh, government directly extracting, getting information from many of these companies that uh, he alleged, he said that the government has a backdoor or certain ways to get information directly out from these, inf these uh, uh, companies. What we should be worried about is actually how governments are trying to get information from these service providers that we use all the time. And uh, well, uh, as you see, as you know, uh, which I'm get going to get to, uh, since a few years ago, Google has been putting out a transparency report, uh, which talked about in many of the countries uh, that they're in uh, or uh, government has been trying to get information from them. So they release the aggregate number of uh, how many requests for information or requests for deletion they have received from uh, each country, right, on an aggregate basis. For some of the countries, it's left blank. Like for China, it is left blank because it's that state secret. They don't allow you to disclose it. Uh, and uh, Microsoft, I think, followed uh, earlier this year but after Mr. Slowden said what he said, uh, as you know, Facebook, uh, Yahoo, Twitter, everyone started to do the same thing because they want to look like they are more transparent. So from my point of view, one of the first things when I got into the legislature, uh, which actually I did uh, earlier this year in February, was I asked the Hong Kong government how many uh, request for information you have made to ISPs or service providers or websites in Hong Kong. It could be local companies, it could be international companies. How many requests you have made? I, I'm not asking the service providers, okay? I'm asking the government because that's my role, right? So I try to see if, I, if they would answer. Uh, and uh, I want to also know by department, how many uh, each department or police or customs, these are actually the two biggest, uh, 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 two biggest de the, the, the departments with the biggest number of requests, but, uh, or even other departments, you know, what and how many times, they, and what nature, and how many of these were deletion requests, how many of these were uh, requests for personal data of the users and so on, uh, but on, a, on a department breakdown basis. And they answer, they answer. Uh, so, over the last uh, three years, there were over uh, 14,000 user requests. The government admitted that they, in Hong Kong, that they have made to various uh, ISPs uh, or, or, or website or internet or internet companies. Uh, in uh, seven and 7,000, uh, these oh, okay, these are. Two different numbers. Uh, 14,000 are, are user data requests and 7,000 are content removal requests. It doesn't mean that uh, all of these are complied with. Many of them, actually, the companies said no uh, for various reasons. Uh, and anyway, so, so, and later on, I found out from Google that Hong Kong was the only government in the world that has released this number on a departmental basis. Uh, so, hey, hey, I. I, I, I didn't know, but I made a world first. Uh, I didn't know before. Okay. Well, th thank you. But I think really this is, this is something that each and every one of you, maybe in your country, should try to do with your government or try to find your legislator or whoever who might be in a position to, to, to try to get the government to answer these sort of questions. 
So because we really think as a matter of principle that the public has the right to know how government action affects their privacy and free flow of information. And while we acknowledge that there are a lot of re reasonable need for safeguarding, uh, you know, crime prevention and national security, whatever, uh, but, you know, users shouldn't just take your words for granted. They have their rights too. So, uh, I just want to make a small pre-announcement for this afternoon, 4 p.m. I hope you will be back here because uh, 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 some of our friends from the University of Hong Kong, uh, and in particular the Journalism and Media Studies Center, and also uh, Google, uh, which uh, actually sponsored, supported the uh, Hong Kong Transparency Report uh, Initiative. Uh, they just released their website yesterday. I think if you Google these words, you will find the website. And uh, they actually, uh, based on some of the numbers that uh, I was able to extract from the government, they, they went a bit further and uh, pursue further questions to the government about the natures of these uh, information requests and data removal requests. So uh, this is a report about the state of transparency between Hong Kong government and, the, uh, and the, these technology telecom companies, ISPs in Hong Kong. Uh, they gather and analyze the, these uh, legally available and government released data about content removal and, data and personal data requests and uh, with the objective of protecting the fundamental freedoms of the netizen. So I would encourage you 4 p.m. <laughs> today to come back to this panel discussion uh, with uh, these uh, speakers uh, today here. Uh, which room? Okay, PQ304. So hope you will be back here. So as I close, okay, uh, if I, I, I started out by set, talking about the one internet, two systems, but in fact, in the, in the world, if you look at what, if you, after, you know, you heard me talking for an hour, oops, sorry, I overran. Uh, uh, one, one internet, two system, actually it's more than two system. Each of your country, in each of your country, you have more system. You have your own situation. It's actually the same internet that we share, the same technology, uh, this, uh, seemingly the same governance, but in fact, many, many systems, many, many different systems. So how do we make sure that we have, we can achieve really one internet, one system, or one world, one internet? That is the challenge for, uh, for us all. So with that, I close, and uh, thank you. We have no time. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. And well, I actually had got a phone call that said, do you meet Snowden? Yes, at that moment. So I don't know, I, I have any aggravation with him. So finally, I think there's a poster, I think it's quite funny because uh, yeah, that you might talk with the volunteers because uh, yeah, uh, you might know, uh, I may teach you a little bit Cantonese, my learn Z, and then you talk with the volunteers and tell, tell them about the poster, probably they will have a lot of story to tell you. So, time for the coffee break. I don't want to waste your time. Go.